Well, good morning, and Curtis, you want to say it? Welcome home. Oh. Woo. If you don't know, Curtis and Jeff have been battling some stuff and they haven't been able to make it in a while. So it, when we said it's been a month of Sundays, it literally has. And so we're just thrilled. And so welcome home. Welcome home to everyone, whether it's your first time here, your gazillionth time here, or whether you just feel like it's been a gazillion times. <laughs> uh, by home, we mean we want this to be a safe place for you to explore your own beliefs, to question stuff, to decide the answers you thought were answers no longer are, or maybe they are, and, and just to find yourself. And that's what we mean when we say welcome home. Um, today I want to talk about something that's so present in our lives that it's often taken for granted. It exists in multiple states, and by that I don't mean Oklahoma and Texas, although it does exist here and there. I know Texas has it too. And in each person, animal, and planet. Planet? Plant. Wow. Put an extra vowel there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll just rewind this. Yes, Lord. <coughs> All right. Today I'm going to talk about water. How's that sound? I'll, I'll stop trying to frill it with extra words and just say, we're going to talk about water today. See? Let us pray. Abba, Daddy, thank you so much. Just thank you. Lord, bless this message. May it speak to each of us as individuals. May we find the kernels that we each need to, to carry on our day and our week. And, and may we always leave with encouragement above all else. Thank you for the honor of delivering these words today, and may they come directly from you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, if I were to try to outline the 400 plus times that water is mentioned in the Bible, that would be like the most boring PowerPoint meeting ever, you know? So, I'm not, I'm not going there. I like insurance. Yeah, kind of like insurance training. <laughs> Literally a joke that only Carl and I know because we're both in insurance training. So I think it's fair to say that the physical existence, spiritual symbolism, and divine manifestation of water flow through the Bible like... Water. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and it flows throughout God's love letter. Some of the larger pointers to this include the fact that water seems to have existed even before creation. Now, hold that paradox. God created everything, but water was there before God created. Ow. Before the beginning. So maybe you take that, that water is God on some level? Anyway, Genesis 1, starting with chapter 1, says... Chapter 1, starting with verse 1, says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There was no shape, but there were waters. In fact, God even separated the waters from themselves to create the oceans and the skies. And while you ponder that, also drink in the fact get it, <laughs> that although the Bible isn't necessarily written chronologically, it begins with water, and the end of Revelation includes water. And the Spirit and the Bride, in the King James Version, I'm leaving the message up there because I'll read it too, but the King James Version says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The Bible begins and ends with God. But as far as what we can grasp, it also begins and ends with water. Life-giving 
water. And everything in between, water carries the story of both human corruption and redemption. Of course, there's Noah and the great flood in Genesis 7. Later, we have Moses, whose, whose own name means drawn from the water. And he was saved when his sister Miriam floated him, not on lava, toward Pharaoh's daughter. Water later, later served a big purpose during the Exodus, with God both saving the Israelites and destroying the Egyptian pursuers at the Red Sea. After one of the, the, the uh, big plagues was God turning the Nile River, the waters in it, to blood. We have life and we have death in water. God also directed Moses to strike a rock to bring sustaining water to the desert to nourish the travelers. And when the same leader, Moses, later did the same thing out of anger to again bring water to the whiners, you know, who were thirsty again, didn't we just take care of this? But because he acted out of anger, his bringing forth of that same water led to his own exclusion from the promised land. You see, the same water brought in the same way but for, from a different heart, brought different consequences. Here on earth, of course, historically, civilizations surround water sources. That's how they grew, for obvious reasons, for, for life, for trade, for all of it. Water was a big thing, port cities, rivers, all of it. So water, like so much of God's provision on earth, once humans became involved, still can be both life-giving and life-taking. I mean, you get the idea? From desert wells that sparked both wars and weddings in the Bible, just look up Isaac and Rebecca, to the hospitable washing of feet, to temple cleansing rituals, H2O was an obvious major staple of Old Testament life in daily activities, as well as in sacred rites. So if we jump to the New Testament, given that Jesus was in tune with the culture and the needs of his time on earth, is it any doubt that much of his own teaching, ministry, encounters, metaphors, and even miracles relate to water? Jesus met with a Samaritan woman where? At a well. He healed at the pool of Bethesda. His first recorded miracle was turning water to wine, which brings up a whole new rabbit trail we could go down about the foreshadowing of the cleansing properties of water used in rituals being temporary, only to be replaced by the permanent cleansing of the blood of Christ. We're not going to go there today. It's okay, I promise. Um, Christ's first disciples, fishermen, relied on the water and its provision for their livelihood. But lest we turn to the water itself for our guidance, God also reminds us who's in charge of this simultaneously nourishing and harmful compound. God calls, called the rains to flood the earth in Genesis and overcame the water with fire when Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal. This was after a long drought, and just before the rains were again released. So God is the God of water. Jesus himself calmed a storm that was strong enough to scare even those experienced fishermen. Keep that in mind when, you know, they were out and there was the storm. We've all, we've heard, or many of us, if you were near church or been there to, you know, at the time, you know about Jesus sleeping in the boat. And the disciples said, how can you sleep? We're going to die. Well, this wasn't just like an Oklahoma thunderstorm. And those are pretty wicked too. But this was something, remember, these were fishermen that, you know, had been out before. This wasn't their first storm. And it was bad enough that it freaked them out. And yet he can say, peace, be still. 
if that was enough, he also just walked on it. <laughs> when speaking to Nicodemus about the concept of being born again, Jesus applies the spiritual meaning to water, connecting its visual its visualization to a flow, to the flowing of the Holy Spirit that now joins all of us. He more clearly defines the connection in John 7, which is from the reading that Carl read at the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, keep in mind, Jesus was in tune and on topic culturally. And the significance of the feast itself is important. You see, that particular feast it's one of three required pilgrimages every year. We know about Passover. It's one of the other ones. But the Feast of Tabernacles was all about water. The teachings were about it, the, the importance of water. And, and it, it culminated at the end of, of, I believe it was seven full days, at the end of the week of meeting and, and the teachings and, and this whole religious festival where they lived they made these little uh, huts to acknowledge the living quarters of, of their ancestors during the Exodus and all that. So, so everything had meaning, of course. And it culminated in a special ceremony that included pouring water over the altar of God. Water mixed with wine. It's the only time in Jewish ceremony that that occurs, that water is directly poured onto the altar. And it was during that pouring semin the seminary? Am I supposed to go to school? Or is that trying to tell me? Uh, it was during that pouring ceremony that on the last day, the great day of the feast, that's when this goes on. It was during that that it says that Jesus stood and cried out. He didn't just whisper it. There were chants going on. One of the chants at the time was Hosanna, Hosanna, which of course comes into play later, but that was one of the, the rituals even then. And it was on that day that Christ stood, after all these teachings about water, after all the symbolism, after all the mentions, after it's right there in the minds of all the pilgrims, he cries out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. This is after the prayers of, Lord, we are thirsty. It's also prayers for the rains, the winter rains that will bring the crops so they don't starve the next year. It's a harvest festival. Snickers knows. <laughs> and it's also, it's also, um, the prayer is twofold because it's also save us. Save us, Lord. Bring the spiritual quenching that only you can provide. And Jesus stands and essentially declares himself again as the source of that water. That was pretty major stuff. I've spoken before about the, the political ramifications of some of the things that people spoke. And so again, we have the water and Jesus saying, boom, that's me. If you're thirsty, come to me. See, the Bible illustrates water's significance historically as being in existence before creation. It illustrates water scientifically. <coughs> and I mean, do we really need that illustration? We know that it's required for plant life, animal life, and our lives. We know it's a requirement. And water is illustrated in the Bible spiritually with Christ as the living water. And now that we know Christ, the living water can also flow through us via the Holy Spirit. And that scripture states the Holy Spirit is poured out onto us. That also gives us the same access. And you know I'm always going to tie it to why bother, right? Why am I talking about this? Other than a really cool academic angle. It shows that we have a choice because we have ownership of this water now through the Holy Spirit. It flows through us. Do we allow that living water to continue its healing path by releasing it to others, by sharing that love and reflecting that? Or do we poison it with our own thoughts and our own flaws and our own dams 
literally damning other people away from it or tainting it with, well, you can have Jesus if you say the right things, if you believe the right way, if you think the way I think, if you use big words or don't use big words. How do we treat that choice that we have? Because Jesus doesn't need a water treatment plant. The water that he provides is pure. And all we're called to do is reflect it, to pass it on. Yes, we're allowed to add our own flavor to it for us. We're allowed to be in independent people, individuals. I wouldn't want another one of me. Oh, y'all don't want that. You know? And we, we don't want a step for church, <laughs> you know, it's, but God works through that and it's the same water. So what do we do with that? We have the authority to decide on a continuous basis how our own waters flow. And we have the ability, the forgiveness, the grace, and the chance to make corrections to that once we recognize it. See, that's the other thing about water. It can be turned back on. If it's off, if it's you, it can, it can correct. It's, it's so easy to flow, and it goes and does this and turns, and it, it's forgiving in that regard. But it's important that we we use these gifts, not to flood people with theology, but to allow them to experience at the level that works for them the coolness and the quenching and the, the just the health of Jesus. No more, no less. Now, I, I have to admit, with water in the Bible, we've only skimmed the surface today. We waded through the concept of water as a physical and spiritual biblical main idea without even diving into things like baptism. But lest these bad puns become the last straw to oversaturate your patience today, I'm going to end the message with this. Well, I'm just going to end it. And if you don't feel you've gained an ocean of wisdom today, well, we'll just all go to Ted's in a minute and just call it a wash. Let us pray.